first if there's any from homework one. Maddie? Okay. So it says first to identify the values for A, B, H, and K. So A is 1, B is 2, H is 1, and K is 3. So there is no A in B1? There is an A. There's a 1 in front of it if you want to put it there. There's always a coefficient of 1 if there's no coefficient written. Right? There's always a 1x, or you could write 1 times 5 instead of 5. Right? You can always put that there. That's it? That was my big thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's easy enough. Um, anything else on this one? Yeah, go ahead. Just y equals k? Okay. Every single time? For every single one of them. Is that, is that work? That's enough? Okay. Yeah, so it's, this should be relatively straightforward. There's not really anything like tricky or sneaky or complicated that needs to happen. It's just like here's some rules and just use the rules. Um, there's not even really much that you have to like interpret where it could be like a bunch of different things. You know, it just should be relatively straightforward. Um, last call on homework one before we move on to homework two. Okay. Uh, homework two questions, Mackenzie. So it says you deposit $10,500 into an account that pays 10.5 or 10.3 percent interest compounded daily. So we have A is equal to 10,500 times 1 plus 0 0.103 over 365 to the 365T is our model. Are you okay getting to that, Mackenzie? Okay. It says, what is the account's value after seven years and three months? So seven years, three months is 7.25 years. Everybody cool on that? Three months is a quarter of a year, about. Good enough for us. So all we're gonna do is take our model that we developed in part A and plug 7.25 in for T. So 10,500 times 1 plus 0 0.103 divided by 365 to the 365 times 7.25. So that's 22,154.04. Okay, with that. And then the last part says how long until the account is worth $1 million. So this will do graphically, so 10,500 times, I'm just typing my model in to my calculator. And then 1 million is a one with six zeros after it. I'm gonna set my window here so I know that X is, is representing time, so the minimum time we'd be concerned with is zero. I know after seven years, basically it, all, you know, it doubles in value. So if I double again in another seven years, we're at like 40. I double again in another seven years, we're at like 80. I double again in another seven years, and we should be up over a million or up over a hundred thousand there. Um, so it's going to be a while, right? So I'm just going to do like 100 years and see, you know, I don't really know. 
I'm just taking a stab at it. Um, the minimum value that the account can have is 10,500. I guess I'm going to change my scale to 10 year increments. So if I have to look at the x axis, I can tell what's going on there. Um, and then I need to be over a million, but I'm not going to do like crazy over a million. I'm just going to do like 1,250,000 or something, just so I have a little bit of room there to see. And then I don't know, let's say we go up by 100,000s. That's a round number, that should be good. Let's take a look at our graph and see what we get. So here's the account value. Oh, that took off real quick. It didn't take nearly as long as maybe we thought. Why is it not taking so long? The little estimate that we were doing was a linear approximation. Is this thing linear? Definitely not. That definitely not a straight line curve, right? Like if I did this, that's what it would be doing, what we were doing. So it's always going to be, should always be less than your linear approximation if you're trying to figure out like what's a decent window. Um, should be much less than that. So we just need to find that point. So second trace, intersect command. I only have two curves, so I can just press enter three times. So it took uh, about 44 years and three months, right? Because it's just 44.24. So not too bad if you have $10,000 to invest at 20 years old, you'd be a millionaire by the time you're ready to retire without after adding anything in there. 10.3% gain on an investment is, is real good, but it's not like crazy, it's on a crazy number. If you have a, you know, if you have a good mutual fund or something, you might be able to do 10% a year on average over 40 years, that might be rough. But if you've got, if you've got a good trader, you know, like a good person managing your money, that's not a crazy number. It's real good, but it's not like bonkers. So that's not too bad, right, for doing nothing other than waiting. You're not doing the work anyways. Like somebody's out there hustling for you, making trades and stuff. Cool with that, Mac? Okay. Um, Any other questions on this page? Again, this shouldn't have been too bad, right? You're just kind of plugging stuff into a formula, punching some numbers in your calculator, looking at some graphs. The calculator did all the heavy lifting for us as far as like these solving problems or solving parts would have gone. We will eventually, by the end of the chapter, learn how to solve things like that, what we just did exactly like without having to use the calculator to make like a graphical approximation, but we're not there to do that quite yet. Okay. Any other homework follow-ups before we get going on some new stuff? Okie dokie. Let's do it. So, here in this section, we're going to talk about something called Euler's number. And I want to do like a little bit of a thought experiment here with you guys before we get diving in. Um, so imagine we're taking our compound interest formula. And 
strip away some of the pieces here. Let's say just that like P is equal to one and um, you know, like R is equal to one and T is equal to one. Now, in a compound interest situation, the compounding, the change, the exponential growth that's happening, happens in a very orderly fashion, right? It happens like one time per day at exactly one time, or one time per month at exactly one time, or one time per year, all exactly at one time, right? Imagine if we tried to take this same kind of thinking and applied it to like a biological system. So imagine instead of talking about money growing, we're going to talk about like the human population growing. Right? So when is the human population changing? Like how does human population change? The number. Like what things have to happen for either that number to go up or down? This is a real straightforward question. It's not mathematical at all. If there was 10 people before, and then there was 11 people later, what would have had to happen? A baby was born, right? If there was 10 people before, and there's 9 people later, what would have had to happen? Somebody died. Somebody died, right? So those are the two things that are going to cause the population to change, right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. So the rate in which the human population is growing or shrinking is going to depend on births and deaths, right? Everybody agree with that? If you talk about the human population at, in total, like all 7 billion of us, when are those births and deaths happening? Are they happening like every day at like Monday? Like just that all, that all happens on Mondays. No, right? When does it happen? Like all the time, right? Like at every instant, there's probably babies being born and there's probably people dying. Right? The population is big enough that there's changing happening all the time, constantly, right? Does everybody agree with that? In most biological and natural systems, is that going to be the case? No. Yeah, right? Like if you have a big population of things, they're not going to be happening like all at once on one day of the month or something, right? That's not how natural systems work. Everybody, you guys kind of agree with that? That makes sense intuitively? So we would like to find a way to kind of represent that. So if we go ahead and we set P to be 1, R to be 1, and T to be 1, and we're just talking about N, that number of compounds per year. And we say the compounding is really happening all the time, right? What value for N are we talking about there? If, comp if that change is happening all the time, what numeric value would n have? Would it be 10? Would it be more than 10 or less than 10? More, okay, would it be 100? More or less? Okay, would it be 1,000? More or less? Okay, what number? Because we can keep playing this game and the answer is always the same, right? 
It's like a question mark. Do we have a do we have a symbol that represents that? Infinity, right? So obviously we can't plug infinity in and get an answer out of this, right? That's not like a number we can evaluate. Can it just be infinity then? Uh, no. It doesn't. It's not. It won't be. So let's do a little experiment. So what we can do, although we can't plug infinity in and get a number back, right? I can plug in larger and larger and larger values for n, and we can evaluate kind of what's happening to our number and see if it's settling down to one specific value. So I'm going to put n in one column, and I'll put a in the other. a was that formula that I wrote before. So we'll just start with n being 1 first. So this was 1 plus 1 over n to the n. So you see the formula is right here that I wrote in. So I'm just taking 1 plus 1 over whatever number is in this column raised to that same number, right? Which is exactly what you guys described to me, or what our formula was. So there it's 2. Let's see what happens when n is 10. It went up, but maybe that much, not that much. How about when n is 100? Now, n got pretty, a lot bigger there, but the, the value for a there didn't get that much bigger. What if n is 1,000? Barely changed at all. What if n is 10,000? It changed even less. You notice that each time I'm incrementing up, the amount of that a is changing is less and less and less, right? It's changing by less and less and less. What this is called is a limit. So if you have like an algebraic expression like this, and as n approaches, you know, like infinity, if that starts to settle down to a specific number, this is something that's called a limit. It's something you'd study a lot in your calculus course later. Um, so let's just do something absurd like 10 to the 100, right? That's a pretty decent proxy for, oops, for, uh, oops, I, sorry. I need to say equals 10 to the 100. That's a pretty good proxy for infinity. Now that's not right, you piece of junk. I'm mad at this. All right, I'll just do that. Okay, so we see it's kind of, it's eventually just kind of settling down to around this 2.71 number, right? Everybody agree with this? This number is actually an irrational number. It's only the second irrational number of this type. It's called a transcendental irrational number because it cannot be represented as it's irrational because it can't be represented as the as a fraction. And it we call the special kind of irrationals like this transcendentals because it also cannot be the solution to a polynomial equation. So it can't be a radical either. It's like pi is, where pi could be a solution to a polynomial with real coefficients. Right? Or I should say with rational coefficients. I mean, it could be real coefficients. You just have x minus pi. That's, a, that's pretty dumb. Anyways, um, so this number we give a special name to. 
So we give this number the letter, we're going to name it the letter E. This E is named after the mathematician named Leonard Euler. He's back there on the famous mathematician's wall, I think. Yeah, he's on the far right side, second from the top. As he was the one that kind of developed this idea, the E is short, or is in homage to him who did the mathematics for this idea. Um, just to, as a reference, your calculator has this number programmed into it, much in the same way it has E program or has pi programmed into it. Notice above the division symbol on your calculator in blue is the letter E. If I press second in the division symbol, I get that letter E. If I press enter, that is your value to. Uh, for e to 10 decimal places. Obviously, this is irrational. It keeps on going forever without repeating with or without any kind of pattern. Everybody's okay with that idea? Okay. So let's just kind of write down that approximation, but it's about 272. Mackenzie, of course. So, all of our exponential growth and decay problems that we had talked about previously, can you cut in the other room though? I'm happy to, you can just bring them back in a few minutes when you're done with them. Yeah, you just take your time. Don't rush. Don't cut yourself. Just come back when you're done. We don't need a show while we're learning our, our math here of you cutting yourself while you're doing whatever it is you're doing. All right. Um, so we were saying before, we had talked about our exponential growth and decay problems that kind of look like this, right? Very, very 70s, 60s, some things these. Old. Okay, old. Yeah, you look like a geezer. Put a beard on. Um, we talked about being able to represent exponential growth and decay problems this way, right? We can also um, do the same thing by using E. So let me try to remember this. I think... What is the form? This is all we need to do. We'll cover us. I'll just Google real quick. Yep. So here we have, um, if B is positive and A is positive, we're growth. 
if B is negative and A is positive, it's decay. And then if A is opposite, it's the opposite. Um, so just to kind of illustrate what's going on, I wouldn't expect you guys to repeat what I'm about to show you, but I just want to show you like why all of a sudden the H goes away and we don't have to worry about like blah, 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 blah. So what's going to happen here? is I can replace b to the x minus h with b to the x divided by b to the h, right? Just using our rules of exponents that we had talked about previously. And this is the same thing. Um, so I can like tuck that b to the h out here because it's now just like a coefficient. Is okay with that. Since it's not involved with the x, I can just move that part of the fraction into the coefficient, right? And then I can rewrite this power of b as um, e to some new power c all to the x. And if I just rename everything appropriate, this stuff I'm just going to call A. Exponent of an exponent multiplies. And then just if we rename that B, then we're at our other formula. Does that feel okay to you guys? Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea there. Now, I would never ask you to do that. But I just wanted to like the two formulas look quite different. And I just want to give you a feel for like how you would transform to get the base of E in there. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to graph something like y equals 3e to the 2, uh, 2x minus 1. You know, my a is 3, my b is 2, my k is negative 1. Since both of these are positive, that would tell me this is an gr exponential growth equation. Right? Cool with that. And if I wanted to graph this thing, I know that my horizontal asymptote is still y equals negative 1. I know the domain is still all real numbers. And I know the range, since a is positive, is still going to be from k to positive infinity, just like it was for the anything we did yesterday or last time. All that stuff still remains. And if I'm going to choose my x's and y's now, there is no h to depend on, so I would just do like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and just, you know, you're going to get crummy decimals, but that's fine. Like, there's no way to avoid it, because e itself is irrational, so you're always going to get like some goofball decimal out of it instead of, unless you're picking goofball decimals for x. Which, why would you want to do that? 
So I just covered that. Like I literally just finished talking about that. So I said that because there is no H, we're just going to use those ones. Okay. And there's no there's no good way to avoid getting some goofy numbers. So we're just going to use like the obvious negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. Mm -hmm. So I can plug all that stuff in. Notice there's another E option here. So on the left-hand side above the LN, it has the E to the X. That one has the exponent part already built into it, so you don't have to press the exponent button separate. It saves you like two button pushes, but like, you know, I'm about that life. Save me those buttons. So there's my first value. And then if I go back in and change that negative 2 to a negative 1, there's my next one. And if I change that then to a 0, there's that one. I change that to a 1, there's that. If I change that to 2, there's that. Now, I wouldn't bother plotting that one because the number's just like absurd to be on the same scale as the other ones. You guys are hopefully agree with me there, right? But just put it in your table. I don't care if you don't plot all the points for these exponential ones if some of them are like bonkers to put in there. Especially with these E's, it's hard to predict how fast or slow something's going to be growing. I mean, hopefully you get like you know, like three or four of them that are pretty reasonable. So let's see, uh, negative one, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty-two. So my horizontal asymptote at negative one. I was like at, oh, let's use a different color. I was almost, I was like negative 2, negative 9 point, or point 0.9 something. And then I was negative 1 and negative 0.5 something. And then I was well, 2. And then I was like 121 something. So that'll be enough for me. And I missed, but that's okay. Just make a bigger dot. Yes, sir. Of course. So that should be no big deal, right? You guys agree? Okay. Um, the other place that we can use this is when we write our exponential models. So we've talked about what E is and kind of where it comes from. And now we can talk about writing some exponential models with E. So they're all going to kind of be of this form. where the A is whatever your future amount or value is. Amount or value. The R is your rate of change as a decimal. So if it's a percentage, you need to convert it to a decimal. If it's like a whole number, you can just leave it as a whole number, right? Like if it says doubles, then it's just two or whatever. Um, and then T is time. So again, simpler model really from the look of things to either the compound interest formula, really that 
those general exponential growth or decay models, because there's no addition or subtraction, just like multiplication and exponents, which is maybe a little easier to deal with. So let's do a quick example. Go ahead. Yes, sure. So let's say that we have invested $1,000 for 10 years in an account that earned 7.5% annual interest and the compounding, well, we have five different problems where the same basic information, but the number of compounds per year is changing each time. So these ones, we'd use this formula on, you know, because, well, it was 1, 12, 52, 365. But this one, where n is equal to infinity, we need to use our new model with. Everybody cool there? Now I'm just going to type this stuff into my calculator and write down the numbers. I'm not gonna write down the formula that I'm typing in each time. Is everybody okay with that? Since I told you the formula that I'm using, you can imagine where the letters are going or what's going for in for the letters. Uh, so do you think this N is gonna make a big difference, little difference, no difference? Just gut feeling. I don't know that there's any reason you should have any idea. Just take a guess, what do you think? You think there's gonna be a big difference between one year and continuously? Like how many dollars, if you just take a guess? Is it gonna be twice as much, you know, 50% as much? What does your gut say, if you were just to take a guess? You don't, there's no reason you'd know this. It's like literally just guessing. I'm just asking you to think about like how big of an impact you want to do you think this is n is going to have you think it's going to be twice as big okay that's a fair i mean it's we're just guessing who knows right we'll find out here in a second i think you'll be surprised so we have ten thousand times one plus one over one to the 10 times 10 times 1. So I wrote T first and the N second because it'll make it easier to go back and edit it on my calculator. That's the only reason I did it in that order. So the first one we get, what do we get? $1,024. Oh my goodness. That's, I'm so stupid. What did I do wrong here, guys? What I put in for R? Definitely not 7.5%, right? Oy, 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 Mr. Kulik. No wonder. I was like, that can't be right. There we go. 20610 bucks.
Okay? If n changes to 12, how much more? We can all agree that it should be more, right? Do you think it's going to be like $1,000 more, $10,000 more, $100 more? How much more do you think it's going to be? 12 times more? No. Very negligible difference. What was it? About 500 bucks? Not much difference, right? Just double check to make sure I typed that all in right. I was talking to you guys and I got distracted and didn't really. Okay. Yeah, that's all in those bright spots. So 500 bucks is 500 bucks, you know, or about well, a little bit more than five, 510 bucks and 32 cents or something. That's 500 bucks, but over the course of 10 years, you know, eh, 50 extra 50 bucks a year on average, a lot, a lot less exciting. But it did, it made a difference, right? So let's, so going from, 12 to 52, do you think it's going to change more than $500? Less than $500? Yeah, I think you're right. Oof. Made barely any difference at all, right? What, like less than 40 bucks? Well, that's not, uh, that's not super impressive. Let's go to 365. Ugh! You're kidding me. All those extra compounds and it netted me 10 stinking dollars? What a jip. We're getting ripped off here, people. Okay, here's the big dog, though. Infinitely many compounds. Right? That's going to make a whole heap of difference. We predicted twice as much. Are we going to be disappointed? I think so. So 10,000 times e to the 0 0.075 times 10. Wah, wah. Less than $2 better than daily. All those infinitely many compounds. And it just isn't making much of a difference. What would make a heck of a lot more difference? The interest rate. That's where you make your money. You gave me choice of 7.5 daily and 7.6, or I'm sorry, 7.5 daily and 7.4 continuously. Give me the 7.5 daily, I'll take that. Um, but that's the general idea, right, That with that formula. You can use it in general growth situations where you're just describing like, you know, like some biological system or something, or you can use it in a money situation where you're compounding continuously. Cool? You guys happy? You don't look happy. Probably just tired, though, right? You ready to be done? I think that's good for today.